The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Good morning, self! No. Hi guys, um, I'm Rob Zero and hi. Um, some of you might know me from IRC and other places. I'm. Uh, uh, well, I try to be a male consultant in real life, but uh, that's not going too well. So if you guys know any uh, clients that'll, that are looking for male help, there's my simple little web page. And um, it's, if you can't read it because it's blue on blue, stupid op LibreOffice theme here, that's robzero.nodns4.us. I also do... Um, um, mail and DNS uh, services for slackbuilds.org and a few other little things here and there. Um, this is my second self. Uh, I was here last year doing another boring presentation about spam and uh, well this one's slightly different than last year. Things are evolving so um, Alrighty, well that's my, th my theme. I just picked a default one out of uh, LibreOffice and this is called um, Recommendation of a Strategy and I thought that was appropriate because we're, that's what we're all about here. We're about strategies to try and fight what the spammers are doing. And we've got a nice little maze down here in the corner. Okay. I want to do a quick little preface. So this is, the talk was about um, the enemy within, spammer, spam the enemy within, and um, it's about a, well I hate to say it's a new type of uh, malware that they're using, but um, it's certainly a nasty one. Um, and I wanted to talk first a little bit about who um, the spammers in the world are. Um, the Spam House Project, who does a lot to protect people worldwide from the effects of spam, have done a lot of research into it. And they maintain a thing they call the ROXO, the Register of Known Spam Operations. I gave the URL there, which you're not going to be able to hit thanks to our lousy internet. Um, and that's another story. I was up way too late last night trying to get the... Um, self-network going. Anyway, on that page, I've quoted from them, it says that 100 spam operations are responsible for approximately 80 percent of your spam. That's not very many, and that's a lot of spam. When you consider that roughly, it's hard to say exactly, but anywhere from 80 to 95 percent of all traffic on TCP port 25 is abuse. It is spam. 80% of that comes from 100 known operations. Each one, according to Spam House, typically consists of one to five people, and I use the term loosely, for approximately a grand total of 300 to 400 people in the world. I'm sorry, that just boggles my mind that 400 people have been able to make emails such a mess for everyone. Um, one thing I would like to ask before we go any further is are there any people in here that, that work in mail or uh, Postmaster or even if you run your own mail server? Good, all right. <sighs> It's, the talk is mostly to you folks, but it's, um, hopefully it's not going to put everybody else to sleep. We'll see. If they were driving all night, it might. <laughs> um, now there's a, 
ongoing cycle of how things change. And as I mentioned before, things have changed a little bit since last year. One thing I've seen several times, the, the, what I call the enemy within, I've seen that several times in the past year. Fortunately, I don't have any Windows users, so it didn't hit me, but I have been called in to help a few times. And basically the way it works is the spammer does something. We, mail administrators and even end users, pick up on what it is they're doing and we do things to avoid that. Then they adapt, they change their strategies to, a, to get around what we were doing to avoid them. And it just goes on and on. Um, in the recent past, it was mostly like this, um, and, and it still is mostly this way even now, that th spammers are using a certain number of main tools. And on this page, I'm going to just touch on uh, four of them. We're going to go into depth on um, how some of these are used in further slides. but. Um, their main tools, and these are prioritized. The main tool that spammers are using nowadays are the spam botnets, um, malware, or like I like to call it, ratware. See our little maze. Um, <clears throat> and um, a second secondary um, tool they're using is free mail accounts from providers such as Yahoo and Hotmail and Gmail and you name it. They have um, scripted a lot of these uh, web interfaces. They do have some uh, servers and networks that are under their own control. And there are cases, not very many that are documented well that I know of, but that they've used cheaper or cheap labor in third world countries and sometimes even um, online games to help break CAPTCHAs where they're not paying any paying people and they're getting uh, a free service for the, from them. Why do you think breaking CAPTCHAs is a good thing for a spammer? Any? Register for free accounts, exactly. That's what they're doing. And um, all right, that's that slide. Let's move on. And we're not prioritized here. We're going to go, we're going to talk about the spam networks first. Um, as it says there, the direct sending from spammers from networks under their control is a waning tactic. Tactic. They are not doing this as much as they had been. And it's continuing to decline. It still exists. Now here in USA we have a law called uh, can spam or as people in the um, anti-spam community like to call it, it's you can spam because it tried to legitimize certain illegitimate marketing practices. Basically, it's okay to steal email addresses and send unsolicited bulk mail as long as you meet these requirements. You've got to have unsubscribed links in the spam. You've got to give them a real sender address rather than show somebody at Gmail, um, and you also have has to have other conf, uh, other contact information in the spam. Now, usually these unsubscribe links, they might work, but they might not do what you expect. Um, sometimes you will click an unsubscribe link in a spam, and you're going to end up subscribed to other spam lists. There are certain kinds of spammers that we call pink or pink spammers or gray hat senders that um, actually do try to launder their list and they try to keep it clean. They don't care if it's dirty coming in, but when people complain, they try to clean it up. That accounts for the other 20% that uh, Spam House didn't, um, that aren't coming from the rock soap folks. And some people do subscribe. I mean, Go figure. Another type of um, 
spam that you'll see from spammers networks is um, the um, what we call snowshoe spam, in which snowshoe is a kind of an alien concept to those of us here in the South. But I guess them Yankees strip a tennis racket on their foot and walk across the snow with that thing. It spreads out the weight over a larger area. Um, and that's what snowshoe spam is all about. They'll get a large range of IP addresses and they'll send a few from this one and a few from that one and then a few from another one and it just um, there's only a, a small amount hitting any particular spam trap so we get to the what's called the whack-a-mole tactic you try to you see one pop up here and you whack it and you see one pop up over there and you hit over there well it doesn't work unless you're going to block the whole range and that might be a little more than the more careful DNS block lists are going to want to do. Um, I mentioned here about the range being well camouflaged. Camouflage in those terms, I'm talking about the reverse DNS, forward and reverse DNS of the uh, IP addresses in the range. It's all, they're almost always going to have good forward and reverse DNS. Sometimes it looks spammy though, just, you can just look down a list of a slant 24 and you can see names that just don't sound right. And oftentimes that's uh, being used for snowshoe. Snowshoe spam is becoming more expensive. As you all know, in the past year we did run out of um, we, IANA, that is, ran out of um, IPv4 address space. It's all allocated out to the uh, regional registries now. So as the availability of IPv4 addresses becomes less, the addresses become more expensive. And well, spammers are all about not spending money. They're all about offloading their cost onto everybody else. So as I say, we're seeing less and less snowshoe spam, which is good because snowshoe has been pretty hard to fight. Moving on to the free mail accounts, we have, um, there's two different ways they're going to use free mail accounts. What's that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, one way is, as we talked about before, they're breaking the CAPTCHAs and they're signing up um, accounts for one-time spam runs and they're signing them up by the hundreds, thousands. Um, these are real accounts with free mail providers, but they're disposable. They're going to just send one large spam run through that account. And yes, it's going to get past a lot of filtering, but then usually what happens is the free mail provider is going to detect that there was too much sent and they're going to shut them down, hopefully. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another thing they'll do is they will um, crack um, a real user's um, credentials for their mail account. Um, my own brother-in-law in real life passed away uh, some years back and he was a Yahoo user. Um, six months after the funeral we heard from him. Well, nice to hear from you Ron. <laughs> um, no, he was, it was, um, his account had been broken into by spammers and it was real easy to see. We, we got um, two messages about 12 hours apart. One of them was from an IP address in Korea and the other one was in uh, England. So if you can get there in 12 hours you're doing a pretty good job. Um, another thing that these free mail accounts do and, and as it did for my brother-in-law, well they got my address from him. They harvested his address book and um, added quite a bit to their spam list that way. 
Also, some people don't realize this, but um, you can't trust the sender address on an email. The vast majority of spam that is sent out is sent out with a false sender address. It may be a real address, but it, wasn't it was not sent by that person. And so some people that don't understand this have whitelisted the sender address. Oh, sure, I want to hear from Ron. Well, it's not him. It's spam. Finally, we're getting to the botnets. Uh, as I mentioned before, botnet is the biggest single tool that, that the uh, spammers are using now and in time to come. The um, definition of a botnet is it's a group of infected Microsoft Windows machines with one, or two, one of two basic types of ratware. Now, it is when, we don't know of any uh, of this sort of ratware that has affected non-Windows users. That includes Macs and um, Linux, of course. Um, the two basic types, and um, we'll just touch on them here. Uh, two basic types are the direct-to-MX, which means the ratware actually goes, has a list of email addresses, and it goes directly to the mail server for those addresses. It looks up the MX, the mail exchanger record, and tries to connect out on port 25 to send spam to that address. The second kind, and this is what is increasing, and this is the subject of the talk. We're finally getting to that, uh, how far into the talk we are. Um, relaying ratware that sends through the infected person's mail user agent. This is what I call the enemy within. Now, let's look at direct to MX ratware a little bit here. Um, in general, direct to MX ratware is a solved problem for most uh, mail systems. At least for mine, it's not a, a significant problem. If you are affected by this, say you're running a site that has a user with direct to MX ratware, you might be blacklisted. Well, how will that happen? It happened to me in, I think, 2004 when um, I was maintaining a mail server for a small company in Texas. Um, they got uh, some users with viruses that just started spewing out a lot of junk. We solved it real quick by blocking port 25 outbound. Um, there's really no reason why a mail client needs to connect out on port 25. Even if you're using an external mail service, most of them are going to offer submission on port 587. And that's safe from spam because it's only going to accept authenticated mail. Oh, well, it's safe from some types of spam, you might say. Um, but it's not going to get the same type of um, abuse that port 25 gets. And then what you do with the originating site? Well, you clean up your viruses. We had <coughs> our port 25 blocked there at uh, the Texas company. And uh, I had it logging whoever was hitting port 25. Well, we found them real quick. Um, we sent people in to get the uh, viruses cleaned up, and it was no problem anymore. After a while, we came off the blacklist, and uh, it was all done with. It wasn't a real big deal. During the time it was actually sending out, we were blacklisted, and our legitimate mail was being blocked. Now, for the receiving site, there, it's also pretty easy. We've got um, as I mentioned, blocking port 25 above there, a lot of uh, 
uh, end user ISPs do that anyway. I don't know how many of them do it these days, but I know when I was on AT&T, you can't go out on port 25. Who's that? Time Warner does. Comcast did. When I was on Comcast, I was able to get out on 25, but I think they have changed that. And it might be different in certain regions. Um, yes, AT&T in Ohio, you can ask for an override. That's, that's going to be um, true in a lot of ISPs, that you're going to be able to go to them and say, I would like to get out on port 25, and, and they will do it. Um, Hopefully they're going to keep an eye on you and shut you down if you do get a, uh, a spam zombie. But um, that's your responsibility to take care of that. Another thing that um, trips up the um, direct to MX ratware quite a bit is the behavioral problems that they exhibit. I, was, I imagine some of you folks are programmers here and um, can you imagine the challenges that these ratware authors face? They're trying to get, in a tiny little virus, they're trying to get something that implements SMTP in a sensible way. They, uh, they often, they're not able to rely on getting the replies back from the server. SMTP is an interactive protocol. Um, we have several um, uh, ways of tripping them up. I mentioned here gray listing, which is not something I do or recommend anymore, but, but it still does trip up a lot of the zombies. The greet pause and uh, MX priority violations. Well, a lot of these things, they go directly to a secondary or lower priority mail exchanger. Rather than going to the first one like they're supposed to do, and then only to the, to the lower priority after they have hit the highest priority. So overall, it's not too big a problem for anyone. And as we mentioned, these, the use of this um, direct EMX is waning. And it looks like I've kind of repeated myself on this next slide here. See, I didn't have time to prepare thanks to time order cable. Let's hear it for Time Warner cab Cable, Alan. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to go over this real quick because I've already basically covered this. Um, many ISPs do block port 25. We look at IP reputation. Um, a lot of this is going to come from dynamic IP address space. That is listed on um, the Spam House Policy Block List, or PBL, which, uh, oh, they started that, I don't remember how many years ago, four or five? And it has helped a great deal because it lists large uh, areas of, I, of IP space that really should not be sending direct mail. Now, if you have a mail server in PBL, you have good forward and reverse DNS. It does not look like it's dynamic. It doesn't say that it's some pool address or dynamic or user or whatever. Um, you can get yourself removed from that um, uh, policy block list. Another thing is that um, once uh, direct to MX ratware starts sending out a lot, it's going to very quickly get detected by uh, spam traps in uh, such blacklist as the uh, CBL, the composite blacklist, which is part of the Spam House uh, Zen list. Another thing you'll see a lot of um, um, these zombies coming from hosts which don't have proper reverse DNS, like no PTR. Um, most of Asia is that way. They don't have reverse DNS out there. Uh, a lot of the end user space is going to have a, a PTR that looks clearly like it's a dynamic address. 
Uh, some of them, the, the pointer and the A record don't match. So these are ways that you can often trip up the uh, uh, direct EMX. And as I mentioned before, the misimplementation of standards that these tiny little zombies do. One thing I wanted to mention about direct to MX ratware before we go on is that um, they were a little more careful in those days. They, the way they coded those things, they tried to be like a proper parasite. Generally, a proper parasite doesn't want to kill its host. They tried to be undetected. As they got more and more, as the botnets got to be bigger and bigger, it was less important to pump out as much mail as they could, and so they, they started to hold back a little bit and also try sending twice. I mentioned uh, gray listing. Well, that's not as effective as it used to be because a lot of these direct MX um, bots are going to be sending, they're going to go through the list twice. The second time you see it, oh, I've seen you before, so the gray listing implementation is going to say it's all right. Relaying ratware, the enemy within. That's what we were here for today. What happens when your mail server that you're running has a user that gets infected by this relaying ratware? You're going to notice two things real quick. The first thing you're going to get is a denial of service. This parasite doesn't care whether the host lives or not. It knows that it only has a very brief window of opportunity to take advantage of. It, it's all an automated process, so it's going to keep on spewing as long as it can. But what it's going to do, it's going to saturate your link. It is going to send out as much spam as it possibly can. <clears throat> now, um, I'm the, the, then it's going to go on as your, um, your mail server itself is going to become bogged down. I've seen cases where um, you can't even SSH into the server because of all the uh, use of bandwidth. It's going to, most sites have a bottleneck in terms of their uplink to the internet. Uh, and that, is, that bottleneck is what's going to be full. Your mail queue is going to just keep growing and um, you're not going to be able to get it out. Also, as you start to get detected by the blacklists, you're going to get blocked. There's your second denial of service that you get. All the major blacklists are going to find you, and most of the minor ones, too. All your mail belongs to spam, and it's going to be rejected, even your legitimate mail. You're a spam source. People don't want to take mail from you. The problem of relaying ratware is a little different than that of the direct MX. It's a much bigger problem for the originating site because, as it says, you will be blacklisted. This mail is coming from your server. It's not coming from, as far as anybody else can see, it's not coming from some zombie. It is coming from one of your users to them. The fixes are not going to be real easy. You can't just block a port. You're going to have to know who is the cause of the problem, and you're going to have to hunt them down. The receiving side is going to have a different set of problems, too. At first, your site is not going to be um, blacklisted, and so the very first hour or so, you're going to get quite a bit of the spam into people's mailboxes. 
Uh, there's no behavior problem that, um, like the greet pause, is not going to help because your server, it's real MTA, it knows to wait. It has to wait for that greeting from the banner from the, uh, from the server that it's connecting to. So it's going to sit there and wait. It's not going to be an early talker. Um, eventually, the site is going to be blacklisted, so it's not going to be a problem. But it will be up front for the first little bit. I have noticed in my own mail, I don't get that much spam, but I have noticed some of this class. You can tell by looking at the headers sometimes if it, if it actually did come from a real MTA. <clears throat> There's a bunch of different ways to mitigate this problem. And um, here I'm going to list it, and then we're going to go into each one of these um, um, on separate slides further on. The first thing you're going to want to do is separate your MX mail, uh, the MTA mail transfer agent, from your submission mail, your mail submission agent. You can do that all in one um, uh, particular instance of an of a MTA, such as the one I run. I'm a postfix guy. Um, it's no problem to do that all in one. You're gonna. One thing that I think helps a little here is to require authentication from all your senders, your, from your users. You're gonna want to rate limit your submitting clients. You're going to want to use content filtering, but slightly different from what you're going to apply to the MX. And bottom line, if you can discourage the use of Microsoft MUAs, you're going to be safe. A mail user agent. Um, as far as we know, this is generally uh, Outlook, Outlook Express, and uh, well, what's it called? Windows Live Mail or whatever the replacement of Outlook Express was. I've been out of that so long I don't, I don't know. Okay, now separating MX Mail from, from submission mail, there's more than one way you can do that. The best practice is to force your users onto port 587. Hey, look, if you want to send mail, you're going to use port 587 to do it. Some people have problem. Some people are not politically able to pull that off in their company. But it's not a problem there either. You're just going to, you can just use a different IP address. You can leave your um, submission mail on uh, port 25 on one IP address and take your MX mail on a different IP address. Um, you can use a different host name for submission versus your MX. Now suppose you failed and you use, oh, you, you use mail.example.com for both MX and for, you told all your users, well, send your mail through mail.example.com. That's not a problem either. Just make a new host name for your MX. Your users can still use mail.example.com and you can make mx.example.com and that can be um, where you're going to get your internet mail from. As I mentioned before, the, the main reason you're going to want to do this is the different, different requirements of filtering for submission mail versus MX and we're going to cover that under the content filtering page further down. As I said, I think it helps a little to require authentication from your users when they're sending mail. It does make one more hoop for the ratware to jump through, or one more little maze for them to run through, you might say. Um, maybe. I don't know. As I said, we think that this is um, invoking Outlook via some sort of uh, Windows API, so it's uh, 
it really doesn't matter that much. But it sure does make it easier to identify who has the problem. All you have to do is look in your logs. Successful authentication from joe at example.com. Well, you know to go strangle Mr. Joe. You know to go turn off his computer and uh, get him away from it. It's a whole lot easier to identify and stop the abuse when you know exactly who it came from. Yeah, you can do that with IP addresses also, but you're going to have to, you might have to look up where that IP address is. It's a whole lot easier when you have an actual name to associate to it. Now, you're going to want to rate limit your submitting clients. This is not a silver bullet for the whole problem, but consider how much um, a um, typical user can send out. Um, your rate can be really pretty low for legitimate mail. Um, and to illustrate that, I come packing a weapon today. I'm prepared. I've got a squirt gun here. I can get you wet with this. Right? Okay. Back home, I'm a volunteer fireman. I have a fire truck. I have a $200,000 fire truck with 2.5 inch fire hoses. Those can get you wet too. Which one do you think is going to get you a little wetter? It's pretty easy to tell. That's just it. This relaying ratware is going to try to pump out that 2.5 fire hose of spam at you. Um, a typical user, gosh, if you were really typing at high speed and, or, or even just pointing and clicking in your um, mail client, you're going to be lucky to send out maybe 30 an hour. And if you have a large list of CCs all on one mail, well, that's just one connection. So I think you can set a limit of about 30 an hour and probably be pretty safe. Most people aren't going to be able to hit that. The thing you're going to want to do is also set that to be a hard limit, that when somebody hits that limit, no more mail. No. If you try to send any more than that, you're probably, you probably have a relaying ratware problem. You, what you need to do is tie that in to disable the credentials of the sending user. I say shoot first, ask questions later. Um, now, I mentioned I'm a postfix person, so I, I'm mentioning some uh, postfix uh, rate limiting tools. And uh, the milters are actually, they're, they're a send mail creation, so those will work with send mail also. And I think Exum supports milters too, but I don't know. Is any Exum users here? No? Um, and for some reason, I think it is the dot .info, um, LibreOffice didn't think that was a real URL. So you, get to, you can actually read that one. It's actually white on blue instead of blue on blue. Um, the Postfix policy protocol is, a, um, is another means of doing this. And uh, I've listed three that I know do rate limiting of senders. Post FWD, I guess it's post firewall daemon, uh, which is postfwd.org if you can't read that. Uh, PolicyD, policyd.org, and SQL Gray, which is a gray listing implementation that also happens to do uh, rate limiting of senders. SQLGray.org, and that's gray with an EY. That's the way they spell it for gray listing. I don't know why. Moving on to content filtering, we got a short list of do's and don'ts here. Um, 
on your submission mail, you are going to want to do the um, URIBL uh, test. That's where uh, your content filtering software looks at URLs in the message body. And it's going to have um, usually some sort of spammy domain. They're, why are they doing this? They're wanting to sell something. Almost all the time, that's what it is. It could be politics also, but there too, they're selling a product. Um, URIBL uh, is a URI block list. There's two major services of those, um, URIBL.org and uh, SURBL.org. These are very effective in content filtering. That's also effective used a, a, in MX mail, but you need that for your relaying ratware for your uh, submission mail. You can also look at the spammy content rules like, uh, well, I'm really not too big into Spam Assassin, but I know they've got lots of um, different tests for things that, that are considered spammy for various reasons. And those do help. There are some types of content filtering <coughs> that just aren't going to help. In fact, they are going to be counterproductive. You do not want to do DNSBL tests on your received headers. Most of your users, say you're, uh, um, say you're trying to send mail from here through your submission server at home or Gmail or whatever it is, it's going to have the hotel IP address as your originating IP. I'll almost guarantee you that that IP address is blacklisted. You don't want to look at your received headers and uh, consider that the mail that originated from a blacklisted IP is not good because that's what we're sending from. Legitimate people do that. Another thing that is not good in your content filtering is whitelisting in general. There are two different uh, types of whitelisting that you might want to use are, are sender addresses. As we mentioned before, the ratware might be using these sender addresses. It might be coming from your user. It might be coming from forged addresses also, but um, If, it, if it's from your user, it's, it's not really from that person. You don't want a whitelist based on the sender address. Also, if you're doing whitelisting of uh, known good clients, well, gee, I exchanged a lot of mail with this company over here, example.org. Um, I trust their mail server, so I'm going to bypass my content filtering. Well, no. What happens when they get hit by the relaying ratware? It will happen. If there's Windows users there, it's going to happen. I've listed here three content filtering tools that work with Postfix. They'll also work with um, most, if not all, other uh, mail transfer agents. Um, AmavisD.new is a, um, it, it's really not a content filter. It's more like a, um, a framework for multiple content filters. It receives mail via SMTP from the MTA and then runs it through whatever scanners you have configured and passes it back to the MTA to be delivered. Um, it can be used as a before queue filter, which um, I personally have not done. It's not as safe to do it that way, in my opinion. But, um, but it, it is an option that you have. AmavisD.new is written in Perl, which is rather ugly, but it's a good project, and so is Spam Assassin, which is also in Perl. AmavisD.new has the benefit of running a daemon of its own, and it invokes the Spam Assassin um, processing as a Perl module within that process. So one process gets you um, 
the um, SMTP framework from amavisd.new, and it also runs your spam assassin for you. So it's quite a bargain. Uh, ClamAV is uh, antivirus software that um, it can't hurt. It's, it hasn't been effective in sites that I have used it, but it can't hurt. Um, there too, it's going to be something that um, Mavisd is going to be able to pass directly to. So you're just going to run, as far as the MTA is concerned, you've just got your one content filter, and it's going to pass to both of, of those, or even more. You can even have um, other uh, filters configured. Now, I think we're to the last slide here. Yay! Suppose you got caught with your pants down. You weren't prepared. You hadn't done all this mitigation stuff that I was talking about. What do you do? Well, call Robbo <laughs> for just a few hundred dollars. I can take care of you just fine. No, seriously. Um, I, I do. I will, I will work on these. You can't. Uh, send me email from your server because I'm going to be blocking you since you're blacklisted. But you could get yourself a Gmail account and contact me. The first thing you need to do, the absolute first thing to do, and there's no argument. I get people arguing with me about this when they come into IRC with this problem or when they I even had a, a fellow who hired me and he said, oh no, I can't stop my MTA. I've got to be able to get mail. Well, guess what? You're not getting mail. Your pipe is saturated. You've got all this junk that you're trying to send out and that's coming in from your abused user. You've got to shut it down. You're going to stop the abuse right there. Once it's shut down, your log file, which is going possibly faster than your syslog can keep up with. You're just going to look at the end of it, and you're going to see who your offending user was. OK? It was joe at example.com, so I'm going to revoke those credentials, and we're safe now. Next, you're going to go on, and you're going to send your thug with your um, LART and you're going to remove the ratware from that user's computer, but you don't have to do that right away. That's a low priority thing. You've got it stopped. That's the important thing. Next thing you have, as I mentioned, you've got a huge mail queue. You may have thousands of mails in your queue that you're not able to send out. And this could be a challenge, but usually it's, usually it's not that difficult to identify all the spams that are being held in there. You're going to want to identify them and put them on hold or delete them. You don't want to try them again. Um, as I said, you're listed on various blacklists. It depends how long you let the problem go as to how quickly you'll get back off of those lists. But you're going to want to look and see on the composite block list, which is, uh, I should have given the URL for that. It is, uh, I can't think of it offhand, um, but you can find it from spamhouse.org. But you're going to want to check and see if you are listed on that uh, CBL before you start your MTA up again. If you're still listed on there, most sites in the world are going to be rejecting you anyway, so what's the point? You don't want your legitimate mail to be rejected. For a while after the fact, after you've done the cleanup here, you're going to want to keep an eye on the logs and see how much uh, you're getting rejected. And finally, you're going to want to go into the mitigation strategies we talked about before. And that was it. Does anybody have any questions or comments or, um, or heckling or rotten fruit or 
Beers? Go ahead. Domain keys is a good idea. Yes, I have. Um, um, that's not really going to be going to help very much in this particular instance. I think you're talking about you're talking about uh, being able to identify uh, forged senders when you're talking about domain keys. Yeah, it. Um, <laughs> It does help somewhat. At least you can look at the reputation of the sending host. But um, yeah, right. It's not going to do much good with uh, if uh, supposing it's sending as your user. Well, gee, that's what it's supposed to look like. The ones I have seen, though, I will say, mostly used um, Yahoo addresses. The ones that I've actually cleaned up personally, they used Yahoo addresses from uh, not just yahoo.com but other yahoo subdomains like Asian ones and, and European. Anything else? All right, I think we're done. Thank you all for coming and I hope I didn't bore you too badly. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, 
these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed. Is a thing like that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.